Hello and welcome to this Taylor Wessing webinar update on the subject of arbitration, considerations for life sciences companies. My name is Colin McCall, I'm a transactional IP lawyer in our patents team and I'm joined by two colleagues, Chris Thornham, a partner in our patents team and Lawrence Lieberman, a partner in our disputes and investigations team. Over the next 45 minutes or so, uh, we want to bring you up to date with arbitration as a means of settling disputes in the life sciences. But before we get started, let me say that we would welcome any questions. You can send these using the Q&A icon in the middle of your screens, and we will get back to you by email as soon as we can after the webinar. Please also hold on for a moment for the survey that will pop up on your screen as soon as the webinar finishes. We use the feedback you give us to decide on future webinar topics and also how to improve on the ones we've just given. That's who we are. Okay, so let's start by reminding ourselves about what subject matter can be arbitrated and how arbitration may arise. In the UK, any civil matter can be arbitrated. However, in order for arbitration to arise, the parties need to have agreed to arbitrate the relevant matter, i.e. all that is required is a valid arbitration agreement. To fall within the scope of the Arbitration Act, that agreement must be made at or evidenced in writing. So typically, the arbitration agreement will be a clause within the relevant commercial contract itself, but it can also be set out in a separate agreement or agreed subsequently. As a rule, the English courts are pro-arbitration and will uphold and support the parties' agreement to arbitrate their disputes, staying existing English court proceedings or granting anti-suit injunctions to prevent the commencement or continuation of foreign court proceedings in breach of an arbitration agreement. Although you should note the ECJ decision in West Tankers interpreting the Brussels regulation prevents, or at least for so long as the UK remains part of the EU, it prevents the English courts from granting any anti-suit injunction in respect of proceedings commenced in another EU member state. Given that any civil matter can be arbitrated, clarity is required in the drafting of the arbitration agreement as to what is and what is not to be submitted to arbitration if the parties want to reserve certain matters for the courts. Also, I quite regularly see in agreements that confusingly provide, on the one hand, that the courts of a particular jurisdiction shall have exclusive jurisdiction respect of any proceedings regarding the agreement, but then on the other hand, frequently the next clause, also provide for arbitration in respect of all disputes arising from the agreement, which clearly gives rise to a debate as to whether there is a binding arbitration agreement or not. So such kitchen sink, as I call it, drafting, should be avoided wherever possible so that the intention of the parties to litigate or arbitrate their disputes can be respected. Next, let's consider what the typical advantages and disadvantages of arbitration versus court litigation. For this, I'm going to hand over to Chris Thornham, uh, also in our patents team, Chris. Well, thanks very much, Colin. Um, you can see on the slide that we've put a, a few points. Confidentiality is the first one, and uh, it typically is um, high on the list of, of points that people will raise. It's normally said that arbitration is confidential. In practice, that means what is submitted in writing or said in a hearing is confidential and so is a, a decision along the way or a final um, uh, the determination. So the fact that there is a dispute um, may, on the other hand, become public. For instance, corporates have reporting obligations. Uh, therefore, I think it's probably worth saying confidentiality isn't a total blanket. Most of the substance will remain confidential but uh, the fact that there is an arbitration dispute may become public. So Colin, I think, will be talking further about whether confidentiality is um, particularly advantageous or not in the life sciences. 
It depends whether you want uh, the public flair. Um, maybe I should move to the second point, which is about the subject matter expertise that you can uh, avail yourself of in arbitration. Uh, it, it rather goes hand in hand with procedural flexibility, the, the other point on that slide. Um, in a court litigation, uh, if you're in the High Court, you might have a single judge, and in the Court of Appeal, it's a three-person panel. But what you get is what you're given. You don't really have a choice. Um, you can't choose your judge. In an arbitration, quite commonly, uh, the arbit arbitral tribunal is, form uh, is formed of arbitrators that the parties have chosen in some way. Now, the composition can vary enormously. You could have two, rarely two, because that's an odd number, uh, sorry, an even number. So, so typically, you would want one or three. Lawrence is going to talk a little bit more about the composition, but I think it's fair to say that you could choose your tribunal, each party uh, agreeing a, an arbitrator, um, if it's a single one, or if it's three, they may have uh, one each and then a choice of the third one being determined by uh, those who have been appointed. The procedural flexibility of uh, arbitration is perhaps um, uh, a point that we should really focus on because this is where I think arbitration comes into its own versus court litigation. There are really two types of arbitration proceedings. There's ad hoc and administered. So in the context of arbitration, an ad hoc is where um, the tribunal is formed um, and at that point uh, the tribunal manages the arbitration itself. It hears applications and it makes procedural orders and if it's a particularly busy uh, panel on that tribunal, it may ask the parties to also uh, pay for some administrative assistant or clerk. But the point is the tribunal administers uh, its own business. Um, the alternative is an administered arbitration, and that's where um, the proceedings are administered by a professional arbitration institution, uh, which is providing those arbitration services. So two examples of that are the uh, London Court of International Arbitration, the LCIA, and uh, the clues in the name, that's in London. Um, another one that's very well known is the International Chamber of Commerce uh, Arbitration, ICC, and that's in Paris, uh, both of which are well established with uh, procedural rules. Um, and Lawrence is just going to make a point about that. So I was just, I was just going to actually, Chris, just touching on uh, the, the comments you were making about procedural flexibility, and I think it's, it's, it's an interesting one for, um, for Chris and I, certainly, because we conduct both court litigation and arbitration, and what you find typically in commercial litigation in the High Court, for example, is that um, there will be a case management conference early on at which the directions for the remainder of the litigation uh, will be will be set out, um, and uh, it's not common to have many many variations to those uh, to those directions. The court would expect the parties to have thought carefully about um, the uh, steps on the road to trial. Whereas um, one of the uh, advantages, uh, as Chris was saying, about arbitration is that um, the parties have quite a lot of uh, flexibility to agree uh, uh, their procedural. Uh, uh, timetable and their procedural steps and changes to that and um, quite a bit of time can be spent behind the scenes by the parties um, in agreeing variations to the timing uh, of evidence uh, or uh, the, um, the service of pleadings uh, and so on and then it's presented to the tribunal for blessing or if it's contested for, uh, for a decision um, and that can be um, uh, a, that flexibility can be uh, of benefit to the parties in a way that is not always available in court. Thank, thanks, Lawrence. I think um, flexibility is very much um, a, a key aspect of arbitration, and speed uh, is something that uh, can come with that. 
uh, in theory, you can go quite quickly because you're not tied to a court diary or the availability of um, the next judge in the court roster. Um, however, it is a consensual process, uh, to some extent, arbitration, so a tribunal is going to be reluctant to force a party to comply with a very, very tight timetable um, uh, without good justification. Um, because uh, arbitration has a degree of flexibility, you can have applications on the papers, you can have, out, have them outside the regular court diary, you can have hearings that might start early or finish late, depending on the availability of witnesses, of, of the, the panel, or of the, the lawyers. So if you have an international dispute, parties may fly in, and um, they may, for instance, um, finish on a Saturday, because uh, what's the point of hanging around until Monday? Um, so that flexibility is, is quite important. Um, on things like, for instance, disclosure of documents, in England we come from a tradition of disclosure. Um, one of the things that uh, you can do in an arbitration is tailor that with specific uh, requests for disclosure, specific categories, and uh, the recipient would then respond with either agreement or objections, and uh, the parties could narrow the issues before a hearing. This, this kind of um, to and fro in disclosure um, is something that uh, personally I've had experience of and have found quite, uh, quite a useful technique. Um, there are other aspects of an arbitration, for instance if it's a money claim only and liability is accepted, then privately the parties could decide on a, man, uh, on a minimum and a maximum range. They could convene an arbitration where the only issue is for the tribunal to determine where in the range. Um, flexibility only goes so far though. I think it's worth just saying that there are some duties uh, that uh, can't be uh, derogated away. Uh, in England, the Arbitration Act uh, does provide that uh, uh, in arbitration the tribunal has to act fairly and impartially between the parties. It must allow each party a reasonable opportunity to put their case and deal with the opponent's case, and it must adopt procedures suitable to the circumstances of a particular case so as to provide a fair means for resolution of the dispute. So I've talked quite a bit about um, advantages. A few disadvantages, just to uh, flag them up. Uh, confidentiality is a two-way thing. I think Colin maybe will uh, address that a bit further. Um, uh, in an arbitration, there is typically no appeal, so it's a, um, a form of determination that is uh, once only. Um, the speed can be uh, affected by the size of the arbitration panel, if you have a large panel and you're trying to convene it. Um, those are some of the main disadvantages. Another point to bear in mind is that arbitrators are generally unable to enforce interlocutory measures. So when a court makes a direction, if a party simply fails to comply, it could be in contempt of the court. Uh, if it fails to comply with an arbitrator's direction, it, 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 it could be um, <laughs> told off, but if you actually wanted to uh, enforce, it might be necessary to go to court for a uh, breach of that. So I think those are the main advantages and disadvantages. Final point there on enforcement uh, is something that I think um, Lawrence is going to come back to. Um, it's something that we will deal with in more detail. I think it suffices to say that arbitration awards are generally easier to enforce in other nations than court decisions. And we will perhaps have a little bit more time on that. So if I can return to Colin, I think he's going to talk a little bit now about some specific points for parties in the life sciences considering arbitration. Just, just, just very quickly before we, we hand back to Colin, can I just mention one point um, which I know Colin's going to touch upon, which is, which is the issue of costs. 
And I think only to make the, the, the sort of general comment that historically it was thought that arbitration was a speedier method of dispute resolution than court litigation, and that was the case probably going back 10 years, uh, ten, 10 years ago or so. Um, but in our experience, that's not necessarily uh, the, 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 the case anymore, partly because court case management powers have um, accelerated uh, the conclusion of litigation, um, but also uh, just, uh, you know, generally people's availability uh, has meant that the uh, speed of arbitration isn't necessarily faster. And obviously that has an impact on cost. And the other point that's, that, that is obviously relevant to the cost comparison between arbitration and litigation uh, is that, of course, no one's paying for judges uh, in court litigation, whereas in an arbitration, one is paying for the, uh, for the tribunal, and in a three-member tribunal, uh, that can be a significant cost if they're up at the sort of £400 an hour mark. I mean, in the context of the overall costs, it's often not a big proportion, but it is something to just... Uh, bear in mind. Anyway, it's back to Colin to talk about some specifics for the industry. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, so as, as Chris was saying, one of the key advantages, or conversely, the disadvantages of arbitration is that the proceedings are held in private, and the fact that arbitration is taking place is generally, take, generally protected as secret by the party's obligations of confidence to one, or, one another, subject to what Chris was saying about um, uh, corporate's obligations to disclose um, the, the, the fact of the arbitrations. But as such, a key lever for, uh, for a party, namely the court of public opinion, uh, will not generally be available to either party to an arbitration in the same way as it would be with court lit litigation. So, you know, Take, take, taking that um, issue, um, uh, if, if the relevant contract under which the disputes arise, dispute arises is between parties with similarly sized pockets when it comes to legal spend, then the court of public opinion is likely to be less of an issue for either party. And so there is a, there's probably a significant benefit to both parties in opting for arbitration in order to maintain the secrecy of the detail of their contractual re relationship, um, their ability or not to collaborate effectively, and also the dispute under it. However, as is often the case in the life sciences sector, larger pharmaceutical companies often supplement their development pipeline by in licensing or acquiring development programs from smaller research focused life sciences companies. In these circumstances, there's often a very wide disparity in the ability of the parties to engage in protracted and expensive litigation when disputes as to the correct interpretation of the contract arise. If a dispute does arise, the larger pharmaceutical company generally won't want be shown in public to be a difficult partner for smaller companies to engage with, as this may damage its ability to do further deals with other counterparties looking to outlicense their programs. As such, the Court of, a pub of Public Opinion can be a very significant tool in the smaller company's toolbox, effectively providing a disincentive to the larger pharmaceutical company from taking an unreasonable or over-aggressive line over the interpretation of the contract, or from using its superior spending power to simply game the system. Accordingly, there can be a significant incentive for small, less well-capitalized companies to seek to provide in their contracts with big pharma partners that the parties will resolve their disputes through the courts rather than through arbitration using the public scrutiny that comes with litigation through the courts in order to keep their partner honest, both in terms of their performance under the contract, but also in the contact, conduct of any disputes that may arise under it. Now, interestingly, large pharmaceutical partners tend to be alive to this issue and, in fact, are often happy to show their bona fides during the con contract negotiations by giving their smaller partners the comfort of being able to bring disputes in the public forum if, if that is actually what they would prefer. 
There are, of course, aspects of partnering agreements that both parties will want to keep confidential. For instance, the therapeutic target that the, the parties are focusing on and the commercial terms of the deal, especially where the deal relates to a platform technology where the licensor might be granting licenses on different terms to different partners. However, it's worth considering the issues that are most likely to be disputed in the context of a life sciences partnering agreement, and in particular, the likely timing of such a dispute in the context of the development programme in order to determine whether the confidentiality provided by arbitration provides any real benefit over and above court litigation for such issues. So the issues where disputes typically arise under a partnering agreement are whether a development partner has used the required level of diligence to further development the pro develop program, whether a particular development milestone has been met, whether a royalty is due on the sale of a particular product, or whether exploitation of it in a particular field of use falls outside the license field of use. As regards the financial terms of the deal, typically both parties will want to keep these private. And where this is the case, the courts are likely to agree to keep such details private as between the parties. And as regards the details of the programme, the only one of those issues that I mentioned just now that is likely to arise prior to the nature of the programme becoming publicly known, typically through patent filings, clinical trials applications, or clinical study reports, which are required to be published, is whether or not a party has used the required level of diligence. So in practice, it is likely only in respect to this issue that a party will need to weigh up the benefits of secrecy against the benefits of subjecting its partner's conduct to public scrutiny. As an interesting aside, whether or not a licensee is acting outside the scope of its license, i.e. infringing the intellectual property of the licensor, is likely to be something that will fall within an arbitration agreement relating to the license, especially if it's broadly drafted. Once infringement of an IP right is brought into the scope of an arbitration, this will usually bring validity of the IP right into the scope of the arbitration also. As mentioned before, pretty much any civil matter may be arbitrated, and patent infringement and validity is no exception to this rule. An interesting case where exactly this issue and whether an arbitration clause was binding on parties that were not the original parties to the license in question and the complex jurisdictional consequences that arose where perhaps insufficient attention had been paid to the operation of the original dispute resolution clause in the license when novating, assigning and also granting sub-licenses in respect of that originally granted license is the case of Ablinx and VH squared, which is definitely worth a read. Another key issue to think about when considering arbitration is the choice of which arbitral body should administer the arbitration, and in particular, the fees associated with that arbitral body. Disputes under the life sciences agreements, uh, particularly disputes in respect of whether or not a royalty is payable, tend to be extremely high value. As such, it's worth understanding what the rules of the various arbitral bodies are in relation to A, what the arbitrator may, ch may charge, and B, how the arbitral body will charge for its administration of the arbitration. Some, like the ICC, charge based on the value of the claim, which can be extremely expensive, whereas others, such as the LCIA, charge on a flat hourly basis, which tends to be significantly less expensive for high value claims. So I'll now pass over to Lawrence to talk more about uh, the practicalities of arbitration. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Um, so, um, C Colin has uh, touched on this uh, already uh, briefly, but one, obviously one of the most uh, important decisions to make when considering resolving disputes uh, in your contracts by way of arbitration uh, is whether you specify an arbitral body and its arbitral rules that you might want to use. And as Chris said before, of course, ad hoc arbitration is, is of course, possible, uh, and we see that, um, and we conduct arbitrations which are ad hoc. Uh, 
uh, where the clause might, for example, just simply say that the parties agree to resolve their disputes finally by way of arbitration, perhaps specifying the number of arbitrators, but without specifying a specific set of arbitral rules. But uh, in our experience, uh, in order to minimise debate and uncertainty, most parties will specify an applicable set of rules. Now, we've handled arbitrations administered by a very wide range of <coughs> arbitral institutions, but there are a few bodies that prove perennially popular, and uh, no doubt some of you will uh, be familiar with these, might have even used their rules. Uh, due to uh, the efficiency of their administrative function, the clarity and the depth of their procedural, procedural rules, uh, and the quality of the arbitrators that sit on their panels. Uh, and so the most common bodies and rules that we come across are the ICC uh, and the LCIA, as has been mentioned uh, already, um, but also uh, uh, the SIAC, the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. And that's popular where one uh, or both contract parties are South Asian or Southeast Asian. Now, uh, all of those bodies have model arbitration clauses as well, which you'll find in their rules, and that, those can be incorporated into the contract, which can avoid some of the problems uh, that Colin mentioned earlier uh, about the kitchen sink uh, type, of, uh, type of drafting. There are, of course, differences between the different institutions' rules, uh, and that's a huge topic in itself and beyond the scope of today's session. Uh, but we would be happy, of course, to discuss uh, 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 those nuances in more detail separately. Having said that, there is also a degree of overlap, uh, including uh, around key issues such as the appointment of the tribunal, uh, including expedited appointment and the rules uh, around that, uh, and also obtaining urgent relief, uh, as well as uh, uh, around joinder and consolidation of multiple arbitrations, which can arise where there might be multiple contracts uh, governing related commercial transactions. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good degree of overlap between uh, the main institutions uh, around the, the conduct of the arbitration itself. Uh, it's also worth noting that the procedural rules of one of those institutions is a different concept legally from the procedural law, uh, which is generally uh, applicable through the choice of the arbitral seat, which is an issue that I'll uh, touch on later. Now, Chris spoke a little bit before uh, about the composition uh, of the tribunal, and clearly the choice of the arbitral panel is going to be very important. And as we mentioned, one of the perceived advantages of arbitration over court litigation is the ability to also be able to select a non-lawyer as a tribunal member with industry expertise. And in a highly technical and regulated uh, area uh, such as life sciences, that can be very useful, and we've seen examples of that. Um, one of the big decisions when considering an arbitration agreement is uh, the choice of one or three arbitrators and also, of course, how they are chosen. And the, the main advantage of one arbitrator, as you'd expect, is cost, although it can also accelerate the conclusion of the arbitration as only one diary needs to be coordinated. And when I say cost, I mean less cost. And the main disadvantage uh, for a single arbitrator uh, is that if that arbitrator is against you, against us, against our client, then you uh, can be stuck with that. Um, and of course, you don't have the tempering effect of other panel members in the decision making. Uh, and in a number of the life sciences arbitrations that we uh, conduct, there is often both an IP uh, element um, and a commercial element. Uh, and so there may be a patent that's applicable with geographic or temporal restrictions, but also contractual and commercial issues, including uh, matters such as variation of contractual rights, estoppel, complex damages calculations, and so on. Uh, and uh, just by way of example, having uh, a three-member tribunal that might be composed perhaps of a patent licensing expert, uh, a former commercial director in a pharmaceutical company and a senior commercial QC, um, you can see how that is quite an effective blend of skills and experience for resolving uh, life sciences commercial arbitrations. So it's also important to consider the seat of the arbitration, and that's not necessarily the same as the location. Now, the seat of the arbitration is the geographic location to which the arbitration is legally tied. Typically, a city is chosen as a seat, so you will see uh, in arbitration clauses uh, uh, the seat in London uh, or New Delhi or whatever it happens to be. 
Uh, under English law, at least, the procedural law and framework is the law of the seat, uh, including access to the local courts for interim relief, challenges to the jurisdiction of the tribunal, and so on. So for well-established common law jurisdictions such as England and Singapore, parties can be confident of a robust pro-arbitration regime with the courts reluctant to intervene unless necessary. Now the location, uh, of course, is an entirely practical choice and it's perfectly possible to hold interim hearings and even the final hearing in a location that is convenient to the parties even if that is not the seat of the arbitration. So for example, uh, I've conducted an arbitration recently with a New Delhi seat but the hearings were held in Hong Kong. Equally, I've run arbitrations governed by the Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre rules with a Hong Kong seat, but I've run those from London uh, in a arbitration where the parties were English and Chinese. And given, of course, that these days proceedings can be conducted internationally by email and telephone, with the only need for a physical appearance to take place if the arbitration makes its way uh, all the way to, the to a final hearing, uh, one can see um, that um, uh, international arbitrations can be conducted from one location uh, relatively easily. So finally, turning to choice of law, um, there are a number of possible laws that might apply in an arbitration context, and where the dispute is contractual, as of course many of your cases will be, the governing law of the contract will typically be the substantive law of the arbitration agreement, but it's always safest to specify a governing law in the arbitration agreement itself. The arbitration agreement can be governed by a separate law to the main contract, but that's not common unless there's a particular reason for it. The arbitration proceedings themselves are regulated by the procedural law, which may be significant if, for example, a remedy is available under the procedural law, but not under the governing law of the contract. The procedural law will typically be the law of the seat of the arbitration unless the parties have chosen something else. And if England uh, is chosen as the seat, and obviously we do a lot of English seat arbitrations, then the default procedural framework in the English Arbitration Act that Chris mentioned earlier will apply. And that can be particularly important in, in ad hoc arbitrations where there are no actual rules selected, uh, but equally demonstrates the sense in selecting a set of detailed and clear rules. Careful thought and good advice need to be taken when drafting your contract dispute resolution clause and your arbitration agreement so that an unexpected outcome is prevented. Uh, I've come across situations where no contract governing law is specified, but a seat for the arbitration is, and the tribunal has held that the law of the seat is the substantive law of the arbitration agreement. Um, so that's what I wanted to say in relation to uh, th those issues. Um, uh, and then um, I think we're going to move on to look at um, uh, some, some matters later in the arbitration. Sure. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, decisions as a tribunal, I think, is the, uh, the next topic on the, uh, the slides. Um, to those who are familiar with court litigation, uh, you would, uh, at the end of a trial, you would get the court typically reserving its decision and then writing its decision a little bit later, handing it down, and then the parties um, drawing up an order to reflect the uh, remedies uh, that follow from the judgment. Um, if, if one thinks about arbitration, it is quite similar in the sense that uh, the tribunal uh, at the end of a hearing would typically uh, withdraw to make its decision. Uh, it is possible for the parties to just say, well, uh, all we want is a yes or no, we don't need full reasons. Uh, but given the size or value of a claim that might be being pursued, uh, that's not something that you would normally see in a final decision. You might, in a procedural direction along the way, agree that uh, it's sufficient just to have a yes or no to a particular point and to move on with just some general uh, reasons. But once you've had your trial, your hearing of your arbitration, then that final decision is often referred to as an award. And, and typically, uh, what you would have drawn up is then uh, a, a series of um, uh, directions where there's going to be some uh, forms of relief that are going to be ordered or directed. So one may be 
uh, payment of a sum, there's a financial claim, there may be declarations as to whether there's been a breach of contractual terms or, or, or in some way. Um, there may be uh, an injunction or some direction to restrain or to specifically perform some act. But one thing that the um, arbitration, uh, arbitration um, process can't give you is an order for um, revocation of a public right, such as a patent or a, or a registered trademark or a registered sign. Something like that that's on a public register um, is something that the tribunal doesn't have control over. So the tribunal can uh, make a direction for the party in, uh, to whom the um, uh, registered right is uh, uh, in the hands of. It could make a, a direction for that party to t take steps to surrender the right or to let it lapse. And actually, just as an aside here, surrender of a right may have the effect that, um, as regards third parties, uh, it, it's treated as if the right never existed, whereas um, allowing a right to lapse doesn't affect the right to claim under that right for the past while it was in force. So uh, care is required when uh, thinking about the sort of directions that might be made by uh, a tribunal. If the tribunal directs a party to surrender the right, that has consequences not just in respect of these two parties, but it also has some effect on potentially claims against third parties, whereas allowing it to lapse doesn't extinguish past claims potentially. Certainly that's true in the UK. So those are um, a, a couple of aspects of uh, decisions of the tribunal and remedies. Um, I'm going to invite Lawrence to speak a little bit about enforcement and challenges. Thanks, Chris. So um, we're, we're coming towards the uh, the end of the uh, session, um, but um, enforcement uh, and challenges are two uh, important topics, uh, and they are one of the uh, reasons why life sciences clients uh, do like arbitration. I mean, why all clients do, but in our experience, our, our life sciences clients do. Um, and um, uh, the, the general position is that arbitral awards are uh, simpler and easier to enforce across borders uh, than national court judgments. Uh, awards are enforced uh, by uh, national courts under the New York Convention, uh, and there are currently more than 150 states uh, that are party to the New York Convention. Uh, and national courts are only permitted to set aside an arbitral decision under the Convention uh, in very limited circumstances. Uh, and uh, in the case uh, of an arbitral award obtained in an English seat arbitration, uh, uh, of course the winner would seek to enforce uh, against the loser's assets, whether that's uh, in England uh, or elsewhere in the world, uh, in one of the other Convention states. Um, enforcement of arbitral awards in England uh, is a relatively straightforward process. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, England is the jurisdiction that we are uh, uh, experts uh, in. Uh, and if you are wanting to enforce uh, in uh, another jurisdiction, so if you obtain your arbitral award in England but want to enforce abroad, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, you'll need some, uh, some local advice. But speaking at least from uh, the English perspective, it's a straightforward process. So if a foreign arbitral award is obtained and a party wants to enforce in England, uh, there is a summary procedure in section 66 of the Arbitration Act whereby judgment is entered in the terms of the award and then the usual uh, methods uh, of enforcement um, that are available for enforcing court judgments are uh, uh, ready to be used um, by uh, the judgment creditor. Uh, a New York Convention award is recognised as binding on the persons as between whom it was made, and a local or foreign court will give it recognition on production of the award itself uh, and the original arbitration agreement. And that differs from the typical situation on cross-border enforcement of a court judgment, which often requires the judgment creditor to first register the foreign judgment before it can be enforced, uh, and there can be challenges at that stage. 
So the New York Convention provides limited grounds to enforcement, uh, including uh, incapacity of the parties, serious procedural breaches such as perhaps refusing to hear a witness, uh, or because enforcement would be contrary to public policy. Uh, and whilst historically certain jurisdictions have taken quite a broad and generous approach to that latter category, uh, such, as, uh, such as India, for example, uh, in more recent years there has been a much more pro-arbitration approach in the jurisprudence uh, of, uh, of those courts. Uh, uh, which really limit very much the basis of a successful uh, 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 challenge to enforcement on the grounds of public policy. Um, then, just to talk uh, 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 briefly about challenges, and by challenges um, we, we, we mean uh, uh, appeals, uh, uh, that, that, uh, those are the issues that we're, that, we're, that we're talking about. And as Chris said earlier uh, in the presentation, generally arbitral awards are non-appealable, um, and that's the appeal, if you'll forgive the pun, uh, of arbitration, um, unless of course agreed by the parties uh, or uh, the particular arbitration rules that are chosen allow an appeal, and uh, in the case of the main bodies that we deal with, that's generally not the case. Uh, or, uh, of course, if the arbitration agreement expressly provides for it, and you do see that sometimes, um, it's not that common, but the, you can draft your arbitration agreement to allow for uh, an appeal. Generally, as a, at least as a matter of English law, that would be an appeal would be on the grounds uh, of a serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the proceedings, or an award, and that would be Section 68 of our Arbitration Act. Uh, that the tribunal had no substantive jurisdiction to render the award, that would be section 67, uh, and sometimes you do find an appeal on a point of law, and that would be section 69, uh, but uh, the court's permission is needed uh, for that unless all the parties agree. Uh, and just to uh, give a, an example of how this uh, works in, uh, might work in practice uh, from, uh, from my own uh, experience. So, um, uh, this was uh, a case, it's a reported decision um, uh, in uh, the case of uh, Alchem Laboratories, the Indian pharmaceutical company, against Exmec. Um, so you can, you can look up the decision. Um, and although this was at the, uh, at the pre-final award stage, uh, it did follow an award by the tribunal on its own jurisdiction. So Exmec challenged the jurisdiction of the arbitrator to the arbitrator, and the arbitrator gave an award that he had jurisdiction, and then that was appealed uh, to the High Court. Um, uh, now, in breach of an arbitration agreement uh, in the main contract, Exmec commenced proceedings in the Peruvian courts, which is where it was from. Uh, and Alchem put in a substantive defence, uh, but always reserved its rights to argue that that was in breach of the arbitration agreement. Several years later, Alchem uh, commenced arbitration in, in London, as I mentioned, uh, as the arbitration agreement provided, and Exmec ch challenged the jurisdiction of the tribunal under Section 67 on the basis that the issue was raised judicata in Peru. Um, and uh, I was very pleased um, that the English court found that my client, Alchem, uh, had in fact effectively reserved its rights and had not submitted to the jurisdiction of the Peruvian courts. Uh, and so the appeal was dismissed uh, with the arbitration to continue uh, in, uh, uh, in London. So hopefully that uh, brings, uh, brings to life, um, uh, to some extent, uh, the, the issue of appeal. I'm going to hand back now to Colin uh, just to um, just wrap, up. wrap up and close. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it remains for me to thank you for joining us uh, for this, the second in our series of Life Sciences Disputes webinars. Uh, and to thank my co-speakers, Lawrence and Chris, thank you very much. Um, we'd urge you to visit our Life Sciences microsite, Synapse. Uh, you, you can see the, uh, the details of it on the screen just there, um, where we'll be posting this webinar and our other webinars in this series. And with that in mind, please do look out for your invitation to the next session in this series, which is on regulatory investigations, product liability, and reputation management. Okay, can I just also thank you uh, for people who uh, may have submitted uh, questions for us in the Q&A session, but of course if uh, anything uh, occurs to anybody uh, on the line after uh, we close, uh, then, then do of course uh, get in touch with any general or, or specific queries. Great, yes, and as I, as I mentioned at the outset, please do take a moment to fill in
our feedback survey, which will appear on your screens a few moments after I stop speaking. Thank you. Thank you.